We're grateful for your presence in this class on the Godhead. And you did receive, I think, uh, some handouts. I didn't expect everybody that you received it today to study all that and know it all by tonight. It was just something you'd have to study on uh, as time goes by, and it especially deals with the Trinity. Sister Nancy had mentioned last week the diagram I'd used years ago, and the one I sent out is a little more elaborate than uh, the one I used. I used to just draw, draw a, a triangle. Let me hasten to say that regardless of what anybody uses to try to illustrate three persons in one divine essence or one God, and nothing perfectly illustrates that. Uh, first place, as I've said since the first class, very difficult to uh, understand that, and we'll say more about that in a minute. But there are some passages of Scripture, and you have some of those. But I want to read one, and I don't know how many times we wonder about it, but in the Great Commission, as Matthew records it, Matthew 28, verse 19, he says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Um, it says in the King James, in the name of, actually it's in two. Because what he's saying here is uh, you're baptizing people who obey the gospel into a saved relationship with the divine three. Now, when you get to Acts 2, verse 38, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. That's meaning by the authority of Christ. And thus, Colossians 3, 17, whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father, power through him. So that's one place that you see there is uh, all three of them are mentioned. And then Paul in writing to the church at Ephesus in that familiar passage, Ephesians chapter four, um, talks about how there is uh, one Lord, one Father, and there's one Holy Spirit. Well, anybody that can add one plus one plus one can come up with three. Yet again, we tend to fall back on how we view three persons or three human persons. We're not looking at a human. If I can emphasize anything over and over again. Do not think of God as a human. And uh, nothing that is made is like God, and God is above and beyond all things. So when you look at that one chart, it's striving, and I'll say striving, to point out if we can understand that there's one singular triangle, but it takes three sides to make one. So it's three and one. And we can understand that, I uh, mentioned to J.D. when we first came on tonight before everybody got here that, that we may not be able to understand fully a lot of things, but we can know enough to accept the facts of it. And that's what we're, we're doing here. And keep that um, uh, diagram of the one deity, three persons and one divine essence, the Trinity. Uh, think, keep that in mind. Now, there are religions that believe that when you say there's one God, that you mean just one singular person. And they try to say that that one person manifests himself as Father, manifests himself as Son, manifests himself as Holy Spirit. Now you're familiar with the United Pentecost Church International Incorporated. Uh, these among the Pentecostal people, even if they're not of that particular denomination, are usually known as oneness, holiness. And that's because they believe there's only one person. Uh, and that is God. And thus he just manifests himself in three different ways. Well, you kind of run into a problem with that when you come into Jesus' baptism. Because there you have the Father speaking from heaven. 
you have Christ incarnate uh, being baptized and you have the Holy Spirit descending upon him as a dove. And uh, I've heard these fellows in debate and all they try to do is make light of that, and make silly statements like, oh, you're putting feathers on the Holy Spirit, all that kind of silliness. But many of them in those groups win their audience more by excitement and personal triumph they do by reason and scripture. But when you study the scriptures, such as I sent out to you today, uh, it's clear when you take all of them in their context, uh, that is each verse in the context in which it's found. And I think I suggested that you might need to read the whole chapter in which that's found to try to get an understanding that, that we are talking about one divine essence, but there are three persons who partake of that essence. That's the hard part for us because we don't know anything like that. Especially when we know that one divine essence has no beginning or ending. That whatever is made was made by him. And I say again, I use the word him there. When you read in the scripture, now remember that's God revealing those words. And when he speaks of himself, then we ought to pay attention to the words he used to describe himself. And uh, I mentioned uh, John 14, 15, and 16, where Jesus speaks of the Holy Spirit, the third person of Godhead, becoming the comforter or the paraclete, parakletos in the Greek, uh, and becoming another comforter. He was the first to be with the apostles. That would happen when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. He called him another comforter. Uh, Jesus acted as that comforter while in the flesh, but he was going away. And they would have the Holy Spirit with them, but invisibly. So he would take up the place of Christ. And thus they were able by the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, which they had received uh, as far as power is concerned, to know the will of Christ. So it's through the Holy Spirit that Christ worked to carry out the promise that he'll, he'll cause you to remember everything I said and he'll guide you into all truth. Again. It's hard for us to understand and not think of three individual human persons. That's, that's wrong when we think of that. Uh, the Bible, when you look at all of what it says, makes it very clear there's one God, one divine essence. And when we say one God, that's what we mean, one divine essence without beginning or ending. And there are three subsistences or persons. And they partake of the divine essence. And each one, we know as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, each partakes of the same essence. That's why that you can refer to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So the undivided and total essence that is shared by each of the three persons simultaneously and fully is, is shared by them simultaneously and fully. So whatever is predicated of God is also true of the Father and the Holy Spirit, thus the Son. Uh, so the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Spirit is God. Now, I recognize that herein is a mystery. Some uh, part of it is it's unrevealed. I, I remind you again of what it started out with at the first class of Deuteronomy 29, verse 29, that the secret things belong to God, but the things that are revealed to us, our children forever. So we need to understand um, the fact, if we can't grasp any more than that, that there are three persons that are partakers of the one divine essence. Um, our word trinity comes from the Latin trinitus. And the best way to define that is uh, trinitus means threeness. <laughs> threeness. We don't usually speak of it that way, but it's threeness. Uh, an undivided whole essence. That's the thing you need to remember. And in that 
diagram I gave you, that's what that thing is trying to illustrate, an undivided whole essence. And that's meaning then that there are three distinct persons at the same time. That's why it's illustrated as it is. And uh, the Father is not the Spirit of the Son. The Son is not the Father or the Spirit. And the Spirit is not the Son of the Father. Yet they're the one divine essence. They're God. Now, let me comment a little further about that. It was not, and again, I'm limited to human words. They may not have the right kind of words available to try to represent really what happened. But there is a difference in the person of the Father, the person of the Son, the person of the Holy Spirit. Don't ask me to explain it, because I can't. But I can tell you why I know there's a difference. Because it wasn't the Father's responsibility, again, limited words, limited by words. It wasn't the Holy Spirit's responsibility, neither one of those, to become flesh. It was the responsibility of the second person of the Godhead to become flesh. Now, by implication, I know that means, to put it on a human level, that's the best I can do, that there are different roles or responsibilities that each person in God has. And I've mentioned that passing sometimes, how that the Father is pictured in every case, the first person of Godhead, the one God, the Father, as being the source of all authority. If you look in the material creation, what is said in the New Testament, and it's said also about the creating spiritual things, such as angels, et cetera. Uh, it's the responsibility of the second person of God here to do those things. He, we call many times, the executor of the Father's will. Now, I don't know, don't know that if it was revealed, I can understand it. I don't know how you have those differences in them as to roles they act, or again, I feel feel very uh, incompetent because I can't find the words. I don't know they exist to where we can understand in any other way than saying the Father fulfills a role, the Son fulfills a role, so the Holy Spirit fulfills a role. And so he, the, the second person the, that became Christ, flesh, became human, he has his role to play. Notice, he says, no one comes to the Father but by me. And he says, I'm the way, the truth, the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by him. So no human being can approach the first person of the Godhead, God the Father, except through, and Paul tells Timothy this, the only mediator to bring, between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. So that's his role. Notice also in the judgment, we will appear not before the judgment seat of the Father, not before the judgment seat of the Holy Spirit, Paul says to the Corinthians, we will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So obviously, he has a role of responsibility, for lack of a better way to put it, that he performs that neither the Father nor the Holy Spirit performs. But when we look at the Holy Spirit, you see that he's always in the Scriptures to try to sum it all up. Pictured as the one who reveals and confirms. Um, so how did we get the New Testament of Jesus Christ? It's his testament. But it's the sword of the Spirit, Ephesians 6, 17. How can it be the New Testament of Christ and yet the sword of the Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit convicts people of sin, converts them to Christ, and keeps them faithful. But not without the word of Christ, which is the instrument of the sword of the Spirit uses. I think all these things do is tell us that among the divine person, that while each one is God, so there's one God, that there are, let's put it this way again, struggling for words, there are assignments each one has to fulfill. Uh, again, I, I don't like any of those words, but if you can tell me better ones, I, <laughs> that I'd be glad to use, because this is what we've always struggled with, and Everybody I've ever read, and I've looked after people uh, who've read, written volumes on such as this, 
and they struggle with the same thing. Most all of them will pause and say what I've been saying, that we are limited by finite minds and the words that we have at our disposal. But we can accept the fact of those things. I can accept the fact there's one divine essence. I can accept the fact that there's uh, three persons, not three gods, but three persons of the one God who possess the, uh, whatever is involved in that divine essence without beginning or ending. They share all of that. And um, we can accept that part without being able to fully define it and understand it. So thus, Trinity, freeness, an undivided whole essence in three distinct persons at the same time. God is not one and three, but one in three. Now, if you study all the books, such as uh, uh, Shed's book, it's an old book, or, or Sir, and more than one book, then he'll say things like that. You study some of the others and they'll say the same thing. But when they get through saying it, I don't think you're any better off than accept the facts of there's one essence made up of three persons and they all share equally of that essence. And there are three assignments that each one has. Um, so the divine essence and the divine persons cannot be separated. That's why we've got the diagram of the one deity that shows them that can't be separated. If you take, let's bring it down to the level of a triangle again. You take any side off a triangle, it's not a triangle. So to have the one singular triangle, you must have the three sides. To have the one divine essence, you must have the three persons. Now how they're totally involved in all that, each one with different works they do, I don't know. But God has, the one divine essence has never been alone. Let me put it that way. Let us make man in our image. Well, I don't think he's talking to angels. They were created too. There's a specific reason he created the world and created man. We may not know all that reason. And for all of us who want to go to heaven and live faithful to Christ to get there, we may never fathom that reason until we get there, and there still might be a lot of things we don't know. Because we'll still be just glorified humans. We won't be God. So uh, we'll just have to wait and see about that. That's the reason that I urge you to do all you can. Can I tell anybody this? I have all my life live according to the teachings of the scriptures. That's what he wants us to do. Um, so the essence doesn't exist. Let me emphasize it again apart from the persons, and the persons don't exist apart from the essence. Now, some people have said, well, what happened when Christ came to earth? He left heaven. Well, I've mentioned this a few times because Philippians, Paul said he uh, left the form of God. Well, that leaves me hanging right there. I don't know what form the one divine essence had. I've never read anybody or anybody try to explain what form did the one divine essence have that Christ left when he took upon himself the human form. I know he's a divine person, but I do know some things about him. The Bible says of the one divine essence and in the form that Jesus left when he became Jesus, came the incarnate word, John 1, 14, and, and came to earth. I do know so James says, and the Holy Spirit inspired him to say this, so he rest assured this is God speaking, that God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Question, was Jesus Christ tempted to sin? Well, certainly you are. Well, then we got a contradiction in the scriptures. No. It's part of what went on in order for him to become a man, be tempted at every point like as we are, as human beings are, yet without sin. He put himself into a position to actually be solicited to sin by Satan himself. Now, son, there's been a big argument going on among brethren from time to time, not, not, mainly among the Andes. But uh, they have tried to argue some time ago, well, Christ could not sin. 
impossible for him to see. No, I don't think that's true at all. He, the scriptures, of course, in the Old Testament, prophesying about his life, made it very clear that he would be the sacrifice for sin. He would be the Lamb of God. He would do what was necessary to save man, although we understand that far better knowing the New Testament than you would just under the Old. But when you think about that, then you realize that in giving up the form of God and becoming a man, thus the form of humanity, then he let himself open, be approached by Satan just like you and I are, and all men. Which tells me he wouldn't be much of a savior if he could not have sinned at all, because part of being tempted to sin is to, is to want the desires of the flesh to be gratified. What is amazing is that he could exercise such self-control when it came to the appetites of the flesh. Lust the eyes, uh, pride of life, and so on, lust of the flesh. He never sinned. Now, don't confuse being tempted with sinning. James makes that clear also. Temptation, because we yield to it, leads us to transgress God's law. Remember, John said, Sins the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4. So one can be tempted to sin, but not break God's law. They can resist it. Thus we're taught to resist the devil and he will flee from you. Drawn out of God, he'll draw him out of you. We have to learn how to do that. And we've always pointed out when Jesus, being man, resisted temptation, what was the first thing that he did every time the devil approached him? It is written. So it begins and ends with God's revelation, his word that teaches us how to live. Now, Jesus has blazed the trail, as it were. He's gone before us, and he's left us the way that we can follow in his steps, not only suffering and persecution, but every other way. So it's hard to understand how the second person of the Godhead could leave the form of deity of the one divine essence and leave it and come into the world the way we all got here, through a natural birth. It was a miraculous conception, but through the gestation period and the birth, his growth and development as a boy and so on, like us. Yet that second person was in that young man as he grew from the time of conception. And... Um, he could do what we couldn't do, and that's the thing. This has nothing to do directly with our subject, but always remember, when you talk about the grace of God, there's God's side to our salvation, and that side always has to do with God doing for us what we never could do for ourselves. But he made us intellectual creatures, rational creatures. He made us with a will. So we can choose to follow the truth because we recognize truth and error, or we can choose to reject it and sin. Christ had that same power, but he had such control over himself, his form in, of, of a human, that he never did transgress God's law. Now, look at it as you see him in the garden, and you can see this a little better. What was his human desire in the garden that he placed before the Father in prayer? If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Now, notice, nevertheless, not my will, but thy be done. So he would always yield to the Father's will. So he said, I do always those things that please my Father. So that's why our faith in him, a faith built by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17, an active, obedient, living faith, keeps us on the right path. In the salvation system, he's authorized in the gospel and through the New Testament system. So... You can't separate the divine essence and the divine persons, but you can see that one person left the form of the divine essence and became a human being, and yet it was he was still the second person of the Godhead. Um, let me emphasize again, the essence, the one divine essence, eternal without beginning or end, does not exist apart from the three persons, and the persons do not exist apart from that one divine essence. 
Now, again, you've already seen it. There is a distinction in the persons. Again, the diagram is designed to try to show uh, that very thing. Um, but there's no division, you see, in, in the essence, the divine essence. They've always existed simultaneously, uh, eternally, a singularity in diversity. That's interesting. It's not a diversity that makes them go against one another as three people might. So we're not talking about people. Are. We're talking about divine person. And the three persons that are divine exist within the essence, the one divine essence, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And uh, they have different roles. There's the diversity. The role that we talked about the Father had and the Son had and the Holy Spirit had. Um, I've said this often. The Holy Spirit convicted me of sin. The Holy Spirit converted me to Christ. And the Holy Spirit keeps me faithful to God. But he doesn't do any of those things without my submission to the word of Christ, the sword of the Spirit. He doesn't do any of them directly. Because the word of the seed of the kingdom Luke 8, 11, it must be sown in the hearts of men, meaning taught to men, and they must be of honest good heart, Luke 8, 15, to receive it and carry it out. That's how that they, in faith and love of God, live for him. And it works that way after you become a Christian. That's why that Paul talked about all along, growing in grace, growing in knowledge, all those things. So I think um, it's clear that in God's essence, there are, Three persons, and yet one God. Now, if you say, explain that to me further, I can always say what I've already said. I'll go back and say it again. Um, you can understand the facts of it better than you can fathom it, because there is, uh, as Paul said, great is the mystery of godliness. Even though he's revealed all sorts of things, back to Deuteronomy 29, 29, he has revealed everything. Um, so to, to, to really deny any part of this is to develop, uh, uh, I guess you'd say, uh, pritheism. In other words, there are three gods. We're not saying there are three gods. We're saying there's one God, three persons possess that one divine essence that's eternal. And that they didn't say, hey, I, I think uh, we three persons have just become God, so we'll, we'll possess the divine essence. No, it won't work. Uh, if, if you can comprehend not beginning or ending, let me know. I can't comprehend it. And so uh, have you ever tried to think of something unending and, never, and, and think that it never began, and yet your mind keeps wanting to make a beginning and an ending to it? Because all we've ever experienced has been a beginning and an ending. Even among all the things that are created, even anything you would build. It has a beginning with use. It wears out some way or the other. It's gone. Some things last a lot longer than other things, but uh, same thing's really true of the whole place we live. We're told about our own bodies. One of them in wants to die. Well, James says the body of the spirit is dead, so he's not talking about the spirit. The body returns to the dust from which it came, and that was what God said would happen because sin entering the world back long, long years ago in the days of Adam. But the spirit goes on, and uh, it will exist always. It never ceases. And so you, as a person, created the image of God. Your human person will always be. Now, that's something else that might be hard for us to grasp it just won't always be in this physical body on this terrestrial ball experiencing things as we do in this human body but it's going to go on and again i think luke 16 about the rich man lazarus helps us understand and uh that rich man was the same person without a body as he was in a body now Again, I, I don't want to be where the rich man was, but I sure don't mind being where Lazarus was at that time, or is. You'll find that we have a hard time even referring to that. Got to remember that Lazarus, the rich man, 
are today about where they were when Jesus told that. And everybody that's uh, ever died is one place or the other right now. I know I mentioned this some weeks ago or some time ago, and people will say, well, you know, mom and daddy are waiting on you. A lot again shows how, how long hard it is for us to express ourselves without the limitations that are upon us in the fleshly body and time and space and so on. Because how do you measure anything in eternity like you measure here? Um, you can't. It's impossible. Once you enter eternity, best thing we can know from our standpoint, you're there. Is there any waiting? Is there a sense of waiting? I don't see anything in the Bible I know of, unless you can tell me, that indicates there's a sense of waiting as we have that sense of waiting here. Like you're in a doctor's office and you're waiting. <laughs> best place I can think of right now, <laughs> we have an appointment, you end up waiting <laughs> an hour later before we get in. <laughs> But we don't, it's, it's so different. It's, it's hard for our finite human minds now, even grasping such thing, much less understand one divine essence and three persons in that one divine essence. Each of the persons then, let me emphasize this. This is what I was talking about a while ago, Jesus becoming flesh and the Holy Spirit doing what he did. Um, they have that unique quality. Now this to me, is again, a, how is that possible? They agree in one, yet they have different works. Well, I don't know. But they all possess the one divine essence. The one divine essence cannot exist without the three persons. And yet they all have unique qualities that is the basis of each of the person's distinctions between one another, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, I won't go back over what I've already said along that line. But to know that the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Father, neither the Father nor the Son is the Spirit. So there's something that makes the first person of Godhead our Heavenly Father. There's something that makes the second person of Godhead um, what he is. In the Spirit, the same is true. David, we have a question if you want to. Okay, all right. Sorry. When Jesus, the question is, when Jesus was a man on the earth, did he describe how he was still deity with the Father and the Holy Spirit? Well, the only way I can explain that is what I've already said. He left the form of deity and i don't know what that form is but he had one i know so because the holy spirit said he did through the pen of paul to the philippians but his person was still divine you don't quit being god now was some of his power limited on earth had to be because when it comes to uh the matter of knowing when uh the end of the world is it's not only the father knows well, people think that means that's always that way. Well, no. While he was a man on earth doing what the second person of God had had to do as a man, he didn't know. That doesn't mean once he went back to heaven that it was kept a secret from him because he even prayed that it would be glorified with the Father, with the glory he had with him before the world was. He just glorified humanity at the right hand of God now, ruling. Um, it's like asking, are we going to be judged by the Father and the Holy Spirit? No, we'll be judged by Christ. But they all make up the one divine essence. So we'll be judged by God. The one divine essence. Uh, Jesus is not any more God than God, than the Father is or the Holy Spirit is. They all share equally. It's part of the divine mystery uh, that the persons are as they are. But you have to say by what the scripture states factually about Christ that he had to become, um, he had to be limited in, in becoming man. As, that's why I used the illustration a while ago of he could be tempted as a man. He couldn't be tempted in the form of God in heaven before he tabernacled in the flesh. But he could once he became a man. That shows you a change of things. 
but not change of his deity. He's still the second person of Godhead in the flesh. That help? Uh, are we getting close? I guess not. Uh, we got a while we can go, don't we, JD? We got nine more minutes until 745. Okay. Well, right now, do we have any other questions since we're paused? If not, I could continue on. Yeah, that's that's the only question that we have. Okay. Well, I hope it was answered. Uh, it's a good question, but I think what it does is just show more fully how it is that our mind just can't grasp a lot of this. And again, remember, we're not trying to understand man. We're trying to understand who is not like a man, but is the creator of man. That there's no beginning or ending of it. And the one divine essence can be called him and he's. Now, why does God do that? He's not a human being. That is the one divine essence is not. Uh, well, I'll ask this question to make us think. Why didn't Christ come as a woman instead of a man? Well, when you look at things in the order of God's creation, as far as humanity is concerned. Now, this is not to play down the woman at all. But there wouldn't be any women if it hadn't been for man. Now, here's what I mean by that. When God was looking around and everything was created after Adam was created, he saw in all the creation there wasn't a suitable person to be a partner with Adam. He said, I will make him a help meet for him, which means a help suitable for him. Why was one born in the world? Because she was, by God's divine wisdom, suitable for the man. But when you look at Paul writing in the New Testament, he'll say the head of Christ is God, and the head of man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man. I don't care how many people bow their necks and grit their teeth and jump up and down, pull their hair and holler and whatever they want to holler, just whatever derogatory thing they can say. That's what the Bible says and judges all the last day. But the Bible also tells us how in marriage, a husband is treated his wife. I used to think about it. And then also how the wife is to deal with him. I didn't come up with all that. And none of us are flawless in the practice of any of them. Uh, so that's the best way I can try to say why that God presents himself in a masculine way. Because to present himself in a feminine way makes him subject. But he's not. And he doesn't describe himself as such. And thus, what way would we refer to him? He, as Jesus said of the Holy Spirit, how be it when he, the spirit of truth has come, he shall guide you into all truth. He shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall speak, so on. You read John 14, 15, 16, get all that. But we're trying to understand on the level we are now. And whatever's in this Bible, and specifically the New Testament, is aimed really at one thing. Getting us saved from our sins and reconciling us to God and keeping us reconciled to God. That is the fundamental thing about it. And so even as we study all we can to understand the one divine essence, the three persons, and their different roles and all that kind of thing, uh, we still find ourselves up against a brick wall. Like I say, you can accept the facts of it without fathoming it. Um, I don't know what the properties are of each one that makes them what they are in the work that they do. Attributes is a word we're gonna come across. And that word attributes is used to refer to those qualities that are true of each 
one in the Godhead, each person, each divine person. And those qualities each possesses, each person, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, possesses in common. But I don't know how to refer to some of the things that distinguish those three persons. I don't know how the Father is distinguished from the Son and the Son and the Holy Spirit and Holy Spirit and Son from the Father and so on, but they are. I can accept the fact of the way it's revealed. Uh, even Jesus giving us the model prayer said, here, pray, to, pray in this way, our Father which art in heaven. So uh, that's the best way I know. You're praying to God, and when Jesus was on the earth as a man, he called the first person of God head his heavenly father. So, uh, again, it shows you something about the change of things when he took upon himself and left the form of God, but took on himself the form of, of, a, of a man. Well, I'll tell you what I wanted to urge you to do between now and next week, I, and that is to study what is sent to you. Not difficult, but it may bring out something about those verses that are listed that you may have never just general reading thought about because they're aimed at making you think about one divine essence and the three persons, the Trinity. Uh, and we can know there are three persons without understanding all these things I just mentioned. Um, so there's that unique quality that each one of the persons has in the distinctiveness, yet the oneness of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So that's about the best I can say right now. So I'm going to quit right now this night. So we'll call that lecture uh, and we'll open it up for any questions.